Mute you, Apari. As much as I like dogs, <laughs> we don't need to hear a dog barking at the moment. <laughs> so if you almost made it to 50, but one person, oh, hey, we did make it to 50, we're there. Congo. An answer to the question from Tachi, how will we find it on YouTube? The link will be on the recap post and it will be on the 10 meetups post, <clears throat> excuse me, on Connect. Or you can just Google me on YouTube because you'll find it in my local guides playlist. Warn my kids. Broadcast. What's the message? You need to be quiet up there for the next hour. All right. How's that for mean? <laughs> All right, so we're a little bit past the hour, so I think we'll get started. I'll keep admitting people as they come in, like usual. Um, a few new people have come in since. We've lost a few, so we're, we got up over 50 and then we came back down a bit, down again. And yes, Maria, Nest is really handy. So we're on workshop number three, presented by me. And I'm just letting you know, because a few people came in since I said it, that this workshop will be recorded and go onto YouTube. Anybody that doesn't want to be recorded, if you turn your camera off and mute your microphone, we'll only see your name, so nothing else will appear. Cool, can you all hear me okay? Yep. Excellent. Yes, we can hear you. Yay. All right then, let's get started. So I see you already have muted, so that's cool. Um, We've talked about recording and hosting on YouTube. You're welcome to put questions into the chat. Um, I'll answer them as I see them when it's a good moment to do it. And you're welcome. Well, there'll also be some times for asking questions when it's the right time to do it. Um, and if you need to go, you can leave the meet and come back in. That's no problem at all. Can you hear my wife chatting in the background? That's good. All right, so our program for today, welcome to everyone. And this is quite amazing. So it's a big group, another one joining. What we're going to have a look at first is what sort of photos belong on maps. And for this one, um, this section, you can either type into the chat or you can unmute and say yes or no, whether you think the photo should be on maps. Now, I'm making sure that I'm not picking on anybody so these are all my photos. So I didn't go out to maps and find photos that I think should or shouldn't be there. They're all mine. And we're back to 50 again. We'll also talk about a little bit about file formats and image formats. We'll talk about how I maintain a, a library of images, both online in Google Photos and in Adobe Lightroom, and how I have other online storage as well. We'll do some demos and they'll be a little bit interactive. And then we'll get into composition, which is probably the first really important part of photography. So anybody got any questions before we get into it? No, cool. All right then, let's go. So what I'm gonna do now is show a series of images and I, Jesse's only just woken up, haven't you? <laughs> we'll look at a few images and hands up if your video's on or you can just type into the chat or you can unmute and say yes or no, whichever works for you, whether you think they belong on maps or not. So this first one is a forest near Jembrook, near where I used to live up until a few months ago. Lots of no's, a few yeses. Interestingly, I'd actually go with yes, because this is a named park. It's called Shiprock Park or Shiprock Falls. 
And there's nothing wrong with showing the vibe of a park and the way a park feels on maps. So yes, yes, the forest is on maps. I can share the place if anybody's interested. There's a whole bunch of 360s there that are mine. Okay, let's move on to the next one. How about this one? And I'll say this is at the same place. A few thumbs down, a couple of maybes, occasional yeah, lots of no's. The no's kind of outweigh the yeses on this one. Now this one is kind of a gray area. It's no because it's a selfie, but it could be a yes because that particular park offers the service of abseiling or repelling. So you might use it in a place like that. In this particular one, it's not a publicly available service. And because it's a selfie, it doesn't really belong on maps. And you'll note these decisions are a little bit subjective because people are thinking yes and people are thinking no. How about this one? Actually, just on the last image, Sonia said it's okay because you can't see the face. Um, that's true from a privacy perspective, but you still wouldn't put uh, selfies onto maps. So lots of people are saying no on this one, and I tend to agree. And who said? Falguni said, it's only a leaf. It doesn't represent anything. That's right. In this context, being this close in thing, yep, I'd agree with that. It's too detailed. It doesn't show the place. But imagine if it was a cupcake. What about then? We'll move on. <laughs> How about this one? So this is a sculpture on the side of a, a road near where I live now. Definitely. So if you go hunting on maps, you might just find out what suburb I live in. Not that it's any great secret. Okay. Lots and lots of people are saying yes on this one. Ah, I think Falguni might have an interesting answer there. So this is confusing and a bit poor quality. And Marie is saying, if the feature is the sculpture, you could zoom in closer. Okay, I agree with both of those statements. So yes, sculptures belong on maps. There's a category for them. And we're allowed to add them. They usually do get approved. Um, yes, it is kind of unique. But really, you should go in tighter on the sculpture itself. So you want to show off the artwork at the place, <clears throat> not so much the all of the things that are around that place. So this one will just breeze through, because all the people that said yes before, you're right. <laughs> kind of. But there's a, catch, there's a catch here. If it was a video, it would belong on maps because it's in portrait mode. But because it's maps prefers photos in landscape, so it was a bit of a trick question. I'm kind of naughty that way. So do you know the difference between portrait and landscape shots? Portrait shots are the straight up and down ones. Landscape are the horizontal ones. See, Ananda's pushing his eyebrows together there. How about this one? Pretty nice looking burger. Roberto said he said hundreds of guide photos that seem to be modeling on camera. Yes, they are very much there. Um, for whoever it was who said nope unless it's from a restaurant, Billy B, let's just pretend this is. It's actually not because obviously we're not going to restaurants right now. Most of us, anyway. Um, so normally this one, I'd say yes, because detailed food photos from a place where you can buy food are really good. So there's people saying that you should zoom out and the full photo is not there. And no, because it's not the entire dish. 
Um, those are very subjective things. So yes and no. And it sort of comes down to what's personally right for you in those cases. So if you prefer to zoom out a little bit, that's fine. If you prefer to be zoom in close, that's also fine. Uh, the only thing I'd be careful of when you come outwards is just to make sure there's no other clutter and things like that on the table when you're taking the image. And if you're being advanced, watch out for reflections of yourself and the people you're eating with in plates. I've been caught there. What about this one? So this is a, a shop. Right now it's closed because of COVID. There's a few no's on this. Lots and lots of yeses. Vandana shows, shows the entrance, accessibility. Uh, for Palguni says it should be taken from the front. You can't always do that because there might be a parked car right there, which there is in this case. You can actually see it in the reflection. So the general consensus is yes. I'd say yes for three reasons. It's clear. So you can see which shop it is really easily. You can see that it's a hair beauty and body shop and that's its name. And you can show it's not accessible because of the step in the front. Useful things to go onto maps. What about this one? So it's a famous place. Oh, the nose are pretty universal on this one. <laughs> yes, it is a drawing. <laughs> it's even local guides related. This was produced by Megan and Penny at Local Guides Connect. And I coloured it in. So, and Shook, I coloured it. I'm not pretending to be good at it. <laughs> so this, you're all right, this is a big no because you only want to submit photos. So no cards, no signs, all those sorts of things, no drawings. What about this one? So this is a um, public rubbish tipping facility. So the place itself is on maps. It's lots of no's, a few yeses. This one's also a little bit of a tricks question. I think Sultan's probably got it, um, and Yash as well. And Falguni saying the board's not visible. Savita, too far away. Not very clear, not a good choice. Yeah, basically. So how many times have you guys looked through maps and you found things that have been shot from someone's car that are quite far away or blurry or indistinct? And there are local guides that just drive down the road. And these aren't people that make street view. The people that make street view, this is fine because this is what they do. This is how they work. But the, there are lots of local guides that just drive down the road, taking shot, 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 and putting them on all the businesses that we found or places that they found. What about this one? We've still got more people coming in. Still hovering around the 50 mark, up and down. Yep, and I agree it's blurry. The main reason why I wouldn't put it on, it's blurry and it's a person. So, yep, I think most people figured that one out was a bit of a no. So let's move on to formats. And there's three that I'm going to talk to you about today. JPEG, which is one of the most popular time, kinds of format you'll find. Um, I don't think you'll find a camera that doesn't support it except one. That one is the iPhone, although it can export JPEGs. And there's HEIF, which is the iPhone native format. There's a few other cameras starting to use that now as well. It's very similar to JPEG, but it's not as lossy or it's claimed to be not as lossy. And then there's raw images. Um, I probably shouldn't say images, it's the wrong word, because raw is just the direct readings from the sensor. It's not actually a picture at all. If you just looked at it, it's just numbers, thousands and thousands of numbers. But the computers render them into images. So for JPEG and HEIF, and uh, apologies, Ananda, I did see your feedback on this. I asked Ananda for some feedback, <laughs> and it completely slipped my mind to actually change this. But anyway, um, these images 
tend to be less detail. They're not great to edit because every time you edit one and save it, you lose more detail. So if you edit, edit a JPEG image five times, you lose more detail every single time you save it. Even if you save it at 100%, you still lose detail. And that detail gradually makes your image softer and softer and softer. The advantage of them is that they're small files. And the other advantage of them is they're directly usable by maps. So they're the, the main format that maps accepts. And Ananda, do you want to comment on your other items from this one? You'll have to unmute. I have to unmute, yep. Yeah. Um, no, that's, um, you're, you're doing well. Um, JPEG is a, a good common uh, image format. Um, it's consumable by lots and lots of web services and stuff like that. Um, it's an end product and it's, it's, it's good. Um, if you do want to make it prettier, um, and crop it and change the highlights and shadows and sharpness and reduce noise and stuff like that, uh, white balance and all that, then RAW is a better one to start with. Uh, but there's not a lot of people who uh, will be bothered to work with RAW. Yep. White balance is a really good one to have a quick chat about because probably a lot of people don't know what it is. When you're using a phone, a phone as a camera, it's probably figuring out the white balance for you. And what I mean by white balance is a really simple thing. It's what the camera thinks is white. So if you're outside, white balance is going to be around about the value of daylight, which is a particular kind of light. It's slightly yellow. And the camera usually adjusts that to make your whites nice and white. Um, it can actually be really annoying when you're shooting a sunset and you've forgotten to turn off automatic white balance because you can lose some of that brilliant color that you're seeing. When you're inside, if you're under fluorescent lighting and they're those long strip lights or even the compact fluoro, the little, little curly ones, um, they tend to be quite green. So your camera will compensate and it will make gr more green things look white. Um, similarly, with tungsten lights, they're very, very yellow. So the camera compensates again and tries to shift the color pattern so that you get back to white. Now, if you're using the raw image format, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, you can adjust the white balance later and you can change it to be whatever you want. So if you don't like what choice the camera made, it doesn't matter at all because you can change it to whatever you want it to be without any kind of loss. And you might use presets in your editing tool, whatever that happens to be. Your, whatever your favorite is, I don't mind what you use. Um, and they have things like sunlight, cloudy day. Um, I've got a question, does this mean mobile clicks are perfect for maps? Although that just disappeared out of the question feed. So I'm not sure if that was the whole question actually. Um, yes, they are fine for maps because we don't usually have to edit too much for maps. If you need to edit a JPEG once, um, I'd actually say that's fine and that's okay. For some reason, I've lost the chat now. Uh, yeah, Paul, may I tell you my question? Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are, but I think Paul is on the chat. Paul, I think you're on mute. Oh, okay. Paul may have dropped out for a while. Give him a few seconds, he'll come back. Yeah. The host left us. He is not back yet, I think. Technical oh. issues, maybe. Yeah, put it on. <laughs> Chrome died. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. At least it wasn't as long for us last time. Yeah, we missed Max. So I've lost the question from whoever that was. Do you want to repeat it? Uh, yeah, Paul. Uh, am I audible to you? Yes, you are. Uh, I just wanted to, as you explained about the JPEG images, like, uh, so the mobile clicks are generally the JPEGs and 
more simpler form where you actually capture so is it that the mobile captures are perfect for map they are perfect for maps. Um, maps uses JPEG images itself. Um, when it saves them, it actually converts them to a different format called WebP, but I won't go into those because no cameras natively support WebP that I know of. Oh, um, okay. Thank you. So J JPEG is perfect. Um, don't be too scared to edit a JPEG. If you edit a JPEG once, you'll be okay. You probably won't personally be able to see the difference. If you zoom right in on the pixels, you'll see it. But if you're just looking at a normal sort of level where most people look, you'd never know it had happened. Oh, okay. Bye. Cool. So we'll move on to RAW format. So RAW gives you the best possible detail that your camera can produce. Because I, I touched before that it's not actually an image. RAW is a representation of data from the sensor. So each sensor is thousands and thousands and thousands of pixels. And they're in color patterns, usually red, green, blue. And the camera reads those and it stores that file, of thousands and thousands of sensor readings. And it usually has a JPEG embedded in it so people can easily preview them. So when you're looking at one, you might be looking at the JPEG inside the RAW and not the RAW itself. Some editors do interpret the RAW when you open it, and some don't. They're great to edit for the simple reason is that you can make as many edits as you want in any sequence you want, and you can't lose anything. The downside is you can't actually save a RAW, kind of. Um, you can save a set of changes to a RAW in more advanced editors that use things called sidecar files and they reproduce the changes in the RAW every time you open it. You can also save it as there's a, um, a Adobe format called DNG, which is Adobe's generic RAW. You can save changes into those. Um, Falgunis just asked, there are some images which are clicked using camera and have a lot of edits if these images are fine. Um, they they are, oh, and Jesse's pointed out, I haven't got the slides on. I shall turn those back on. Yes, well done, thank you. I'll just pop back to the slides and open those up again. There we go. They should start presenting in a moment. So the question about if you've got lots of edits on it, um, it's a judgment thing to see how it looks. So Ananda's just put a thing in the chat. I'll open up his RAW. Do you want me to present this, Ananda? Uh, Sahil's asked about the copyright on edited images. The copyright never changes. From the moment you create a photograph, you own that copyright. Um, in some countries, you have to register a copyright. The United States is one of those. Most of them follow a different convention. They follow a, a uh, convention that's been around, I think it's about 60 years old now, but it means that you don't have to register copyright, it's just automatically yours. And it doesn't matter how many times you edit an image, that doesn't change. Um, Falguni said if you edit images a lot, it can make things unrealistic. Yes, it can. Um, and Warris is saying compressed images can be good. Yeah, they certainly have their place. They're really good for websites. They're really good for Lots of storage. Um, Ananda, did you want me to present this image so you can talk about yeah, well, it? Yeah, it's it's fine. Um, if you if you want to show it um, yep. on the screen, yeah, Chrome is acting really weird at the moment. So <laughs> here comes Ananda's image, and you'll have a chat about it. Uh, there was another question there that what happens if two people take the same image at the same time? at the same angle from the same spot, then who's the owner of copyright? Um, that's, that's actually quite a simple one. You both are because you made two different images. It doesn't matter if you shot the exact same image at the exact same time. It just doesn't matter because you both press that shutter button. You both own the rights to your image, but not to the other person's. And it's actually a really interesting question. Um, many, many, many years ago, I took some images of a locomotive on a railway that had only just been released back into traffic. So it had only just been restored. It hadn't run for about 60 something years before that. And 
a guy approached me on Facebook, which is a thing I don't use anymore, but he approached me on Facebook and said, that's my image, I'm going to sue you. And as it happens, it wasn't his image. And as I pointed out to him, it was my kid sitting in the cab. So it does happen. People do get confused. But you own it if you press the button. That's the important thing. So guess what that means if you hand your camera to someone else when you're out on holidays and you say, can you take my picture? Who do you think owns the copyright of that one? Is there, that was the case, there was this case about the monkey uh, taking a photo, uh, remember, Paul? I do indeed, yes. It was a very famous one. Yes, and the monkey wanted to uh, claim copyright. Well, a, a foundation of people acting on behalf of the monkey tried to, yes. <laughs> you do have to be human to have copyright. The, um, the court did find that. So a monkey who takes your camera and takes your picture doesn't own the copyright. You still do because you're the owner of the camera. But if you hand it to a, another person when you're out traveling to take your picture, they own the copyright, even though it's your camera, because they press the button. And that's what it comes down to is who initiates the shot. Who plans it out? Who does the composition? Because the composition is really the bit you're copywriting. It's not the photo itself, really. It's the unique artwork in your image. Um, just as a, a side question, can you take a photo of someone else's photo? Who owns the copyright then? Probably not us. It's actually a really vexing one that's gotten people in trouble. If you take... And I know in my state, this is different all the way around the world, but in my state of Victoria in Australia, if you take an image that the entire composition is someone else's photo, it's called a derivative work. And unless they've allowed you to do that, you're not allowed to do it. But if you take an image that encompasses the work, so it's got a frame and some wall and things like that, interestingly enough, you can do that. You own the copyright to it. There have been a lot of cases where that's been tested out, but in my state, that is the case. That's why when you go into art galleries, you can shoot pictures of the things on the walls, and most of them, no one really minds. So, Ananda, do you want to tell us about this image that we're presenting here? Yeah, it's an uh, impromptu shot. Um, I was out uh, uh, late in the evening uh, doing a walk, um, and I came across this uh, school. Um, it's, it's a nearby school, and I didn't know that... Um, they had uh, devoted a small uh, square piece of land uh, for the uh, 100th anniversary Anzac. Um, that's very close to uh, Paul's heart. Um, I only had my phone camera. So when people say, which is the best camera uh, to have, it's the one that you have in your, po in your pocket. Uh, and I took it out and uh, this camera, uh, this phone has RAW. It, it can shoot RAW as well as JPEG. And I shot both, both. Um, and I came back and I was thinking, would I use the JPEG, which is ready to go? And I did, I, I pushed the JPEG up to Google Maps. Uh, it's portrait, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> <You're not even> <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I usually like to shoot um, uh, landscape, but if you look at this, uh, 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 image, it, it, it has to be portrait. Otherwise, you chop off uh, the major part of the of the of the photo. Um, but so I, I pushed up the JPEG to Google Maps because I, wa I was in a hurry. But coming back home, uh, when you look at the JPEG, um, it's not getting the most out of the of the picture. Um, there's not a lot in the picture. Um, there are very fine details of the wording of the people um, uh, of the Anzacs, and um, it's very hard to pick them up. Um, it's late in the evening, so the, uh, the light is very poor, uh, which means that there's a high level of noise uh, in the picture. So with a JPEG, you can do quite a bit of rescuing um, to get the, the image that you see here. So this is JPEG, of course, uh, but it, it was sourced from a RAW and it took about ooh, five minutes of, of work. Over to you, Paul. Yeah, so basically what Ananda's saying is that he's taken this image late in the evening and he's been able to rescue some of the darkness and potentially some of the highlights that have come because it looks like there was some addi additional light happening there. Um, and in a JPEG, it's very hard to rescue darkness because if you start to brighten up 
the dark levels of the image, and you'll see this later on when I do a demo in Lightroom, if you start to brighten up the dark levels, levels of an image when you're doing a JPEG, you'll start to see all these horrible noise things come into it. When you start getting purples and reds and greens and things like that in the dark areas. If you're not zoomed in, it can be okay. And I'd suggest for Maps it actually is okay because Maps isn't after perfect image quality. Maps is after good enough image quality. And they want you to be able to show off the place. And there are going to be times when you have to break what would be normal photography rules to be able to show that place. It's a bit like Ananda submitting a portrait image. Um, all photography rules, let's put the rabbit ears on them, <laughs> they're things that you choose whether you obey or not. So you should always take rules more as suggestions. And when you're starting out in photography, it's good to follow the rules for a while, at least a few main ones that we'll go through in the composition parts of this. But once you start to get the feeling that you know what you're doing, and I don't care what other people think, it's about you. But when you get the feeling that you know what you're doing, um, you can start to play around and ignore those rules and see what the outcomes are. I mean, one of the classic rules in photography is don't shoot into the sun. Um, that's more about protecting the film and protecting the sensor from getting burnt than anything else. You can quite happily shoot into the sun and you can have some really cool creative effects when you do it. But you do have to be careful and just be mindful that all of that light is getting concentrated in a very small place. So don't set up on a tripod pointed at the sun and leave it there. So I'll just change back to the main presentation. It's one of the few things that I wish it was like a competing product where you can change screens, which would be really cool. If the people in Meet are listening, it would be great to be able to change screens mid-stride. Now, the other side of RAWs is they're usually really, <coughs> excuse me, usually really big. So um, my Olympus, for example, produces RAWs that are about 26 megabytes. Um, megabytes doesn't sound like much, but when you've got thousands and thousands of them, it adds up really quickly. So that's why when you upload them onto the web, they tend to be in JPEG and they tend to get converted to an even smaller format, the one I touched on before called WebP. So I imagine most of you take photos, otherwise you wouldn't be here if you didn't have an interest. Where are you organizing them? Are you organizing them on an online tool like Google Photos or are you organizing them on a local on your computer or perhaps even on your phone. So we could look in the chat or you can, un anybody that wants to talk about this can unmute. So we've got lots of people saying both. I use both. I actually use another cloud service as well. It's a paid one. Um, one thing I would be very careful about with cloud services is, is really two things. The first one is read the terms and conditions very carefully. Make sure that you retain the rights to your image and that you're not surrendering the rights for people to use your images. There are some cloud services that when you upload them, you may find them start to turn up in advertising and things like that because in the T's and C's, they're allowed to do it. The other thing to be really careful of with cloud backup services is make sure you can recover the images preferably without image loss, although even that's acceptable if you know it going in. So Google Photos loses a bit of quality, but that's okay. I accept that. Um, but make sure that you can get them out without paying anything. So some of the free online backup services, and there are big names involved in this, you can upload terabytes of stuff and they never charge you a cent until you want it back. That day you want it back, you have to pay a lot of money to get it back. Google Photos has the advantage of Google Takeout. So if you ever decide to leave, you can get it back all at once in a gigantic zip file, which ironically they put on Drive. So I'll just briefly talk about my approach on the computer. I think I talked about last week, someone asked me how many photos that I take in a year. And on average, it's about 25,000. Though it's, I have that many, um, they don't go to maps. So a lot of my images are shoots with people. Um, I shoot events, the photo walks. I might shoot a thousand images on a big photo walk and I probably only care about 20 of them. That's actually where the idea of the 36 walk came from because I was quite horrified at what I was doing on photo walks. 
and at least I had the constraint to not put them all on maps. So there are people who might shoot a thousand images in a day and they actually do put them all on maps and that's really bad. <laughs> so just what you can see on the screen there, this is what I use in my computer. I have a, a dedicated drive, which is just for photos. There's nothing else on that drive. And I have a particular folder structure. So each year has its own folder. And it's you'll notice at the top, it's sitting in working recent. So that's the last three years of images. After three years, I move them onto a different drive just to try and make sure that this, this drive is a particularly quick one. It's an SSD, just doesn't fill up. And I have, as part of my naming convention, I put in the date of the shoot and the name of the shoot. So I try to be a little bit descriptive of what it is. It helps you find it later. I also use keywords, but we'll sh I'll show you that when I show you Lightroom later on. Now, I use a tool to get all my photos into this state, but you don't have to do that. There's no reason why you can't just copy them by hand. But I have so many photos, I use an ingestion tool. There's no wrong answer for how you organize your photos, by the way. It's up to what you do. I'm just showing you what I do. Um, Maria says, I noticed that's a single digit structure for months. Um, yes, it is until you get to the two digit ones and then it's two, so it varies. Um, quite a few people have talked about Google Photos is good because you can get geotagging and Google Photos can compress images as well. Yeah, a lot of the other storage things let you do that as well. Um, Lightroom now even has a, a AI component which can find similar faces and name the people for you. It's a little bit creepy. <laughs> I let it loose on my library and it, um, it found pretty much everybody. When I'm using Google Photos, I have a slightly different approach. So I, I'm not as rigid as I am on the computer. And there's a really good reason for that, which I'll cover in a moment. So for important stuff that I want to remember, like big events, you can see Connect Live there in 2019, um, the Aussie team photos. Another Connect Live, so one of those is shared. The big one on the left is the shared album that lots of participants are in, and the other one's mine, so it's only got my images in it. Um, inexplicably, there's one called XXX. Whatever, I don't always follow my own rules. <laughs> and then there's the Going to Murica one, which was an album I was sharing with people back in Australia just to show them what I was doing. So there's, that one was a really social nature. But it also had lots of local guides in it, funnily enough, because that's who I was with. Now, I don't use albums for the day-to-day -day thing. So you saw back on the computer, if I go back here and I go back one level, you'll see I've, I've got the dates and I've got the names. And the reason I don't do that in Google Photos is because it takes care of that for me. If I want to know what photos I took, on the 10th of April, 2020, I can go to Google Photos and type that in the search bar and it will show me every photo that I took on that date. It'll also show me every photo that's been shared to me that was taken on that date. So it's really handy for finding stuff. It also tends to keyword things pretty well by itself. Now that's another thing you've got to do by yourself on the computer for the most part. There's some plugins for Lightroom and there's a couple other things that try and do image analysis, but they rely on uploading that image to a website keywording it and you're getting it back. I'd love it if there was something local because I've got just too big a volume of images to do that. So I have to apply my keywords manually. But Google Photos, thanks to Crowdsource, it's the main contributor to this, is awesome at figuring out what photos actually are of. So if you typed in, we covered this briefly last week, if you type in cupcake, it will find all the images of cupcake. So it basically means that you don't need to do all that sort of keywording and categorization and folder work that you do when you're on the computer. Now, here's a, a question for you. If you type into the chat, do you back up your images? I have to admit, I'm really anal retentive about what I do. So there's a few nods going on on the, the video feeds. There's quite a few yeses, but there's not everybody. So backups is an interesting thing. Some people do it, some people don't. Now, if you're only doing phone photography, and you've got it set to upload to Google Photos, you actually are doing a backup. It's an implied backup because that's happening for you. But you do need to be a little bit careful because if you edit them, you haven't got one to go back to. Uh, some people say they did and they used to. Uh, Ollie says he used to burn to DVD. Adrian says I back up the backup. I do that too. 
I'll go through what I do in a moment. It, I did say it was very anal retentive. <laughs> okay, so I'm not actually sure if I put a slide in here for what I do. I did. So when I'm copying off my cards, so when you're using the camera, you have little cards like these things. Hopefully you can see that. Um, this is an SD card. This particular one is actually a micro SD. Uh, when I'm copying the images off, I make two copies. One copy goes into my working folders, those ones I showed you before, which are for editing and playing and manipulation. And it's also where I delete stuff that I don't like. And the second copy is going onto a different drive, different physical drive in the computer. And there's a couple of reasons I do that. Who's ever had the oh shit moment when you've deleted something and you want it back? We've all been there. If you've got that second copy, you've got another chance. You can get it back. And yes, some Windows and Mac have both gotten pretty good at getting files back these days. They tend not to hard delete unless you do shift delete and then you're stuffed. But it's good to be able to get them back because it might not actually be for days that you realized you've deleted the wrong shot. And if you're doing something like a public event or a wedding or something like that, if you lose that money shot, you're going to have a very upset couple on your hand and they're not going to like you very much. So, and they know you took it because <laughs> they were there and they're going to expect it. So if you can get it back, fantastic. Now, there's another reason why I do two copies from the cards. Cards aren't perfect. And there are times when you read a file off the card and it actually gets corrupted during the copy. It doesn't happen very often. And these days, it, it, I have to say, it does. I haven't had it happen probably for a couple of years now, but it used to be really, really common. And if you're making two copies and assuming the source file on the card was perfect, you've at least got that second chance. Now, the next thing I do is everything's duplicated off to a second drive. So that drive I was talking about before, that's an SSD in my computer. Um, it's only... It's, 512 gig or something like that. So I actually can't hold very much on it. And that gets copied at the end of every session off to another drive. I use a, a thing called Fast Backup. It's a very old tool, but it works really well. And it's free. <laughs> and you can configure it to do just about anything you want, but there's plenty of different ways to do it. Every week, I'm not sure if this drive's plugged in. It's not. But every week, things get backed up to one of these. And when I'm allowed to go in, in and out of the office, they get taken into work and they get locked in my desk drawer. So I've got one there and I've got one here. I haven't been able to do that for the last nine weeks, but that's okay because I haven't taken many photos either, so it doesn't really worry me very much. Now, in the house I live in now, I don't have to worry so much about needing an offsite backup. But in the house I lived in before, it was in a bushfire prone area and you might not get much warning at all before you have to leave and leave everything behind. So it was particularly important there. It can be important for things like theft. If your computer gets stolen and you haven't got another copy somewhere else, you've lost everything. Now, the important stuff, I upload to a cloud service. I won't go into which one because um, I don't need to advertise them. It's just a very basic paid service where I can up, upload my files and they don't get changed and they don't get shared with anybody. So they're the important things. Just make sure they don't. Um, it's a, this is a particular company involved in image work that I use. And it's actually part of my package for licensing some of the other things. So I'm gonna show you a few things now. I've been busily charging my phone because I forgot to do that earlier. So I'm going to stop presenting on the screen and I'm just going to show you some basic edits in some of the tools and just show you what some of the differences are. So I'll stop presenting the computer screen and I'll start presenting my phone as soon as I can actually get into this meet. There's a good point. I need to send the link to myself before I do this. I had this all prepared and then Chrome rebooted. Life's like that sometimes. I'm being very organized tonight. So if you just bear with me for just another moment.
Just to present, I have to join the meeting from this as well. We need so. Max with the background music, Paul. Do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> well, the link's here. And I'm joining in. And I hope this week it doesn't cause horrible feedback. I'm just going to turn off my mic and turn off the camera and join in to admit myself, which is strangely weird. Woo, that's awful. Okay, there we go. That's better. It's weird that it does that, even though it's... Uh, and I'm still presenting on this one. Let me just kill that. Now, hopefully, I can figure out how to present on this one. Okay, so I'm starting to see that now. And I'm getting this very disturbing echo. Are you guys getting that? Yep. Yes, we are getting that. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> So, blood coming out from here. So. Yeah, I think even though the volume's turned off, this one's still picking it up and it's going through. You can log out and join in again, the echo will go. I'll just try and be quiet while I do it. Paul, if you have a spare headphone, just try plugging it in. Ah, uh, yes, good point. I do have some. This is going to be really professional. I'm going to run away and come back. <laughs> Oh, no, actually, just mute, mute, mute the other devices, the other one you're presenting on. Is away, Adrian. Uh, you uh, have some photo experience, do you? Uh, not really, no. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, I, I, I do photos, but very hobby level, so. Was anyone dancing then? No. Singing? Oh, I'm sad. We don't have Max today to do that. It was um, so funny when I came back in and I saw what he was doing. It's like, okay, that's good. So let's take uh, one of the images I haven't edited yet. Let's look at this one. So I can't actually tell if I'm presenting on the phone or not anymore. It says I still am. So can you guys see the actual image on the screen? <laughs> yep, good. Because what Meet shows me is not that. <laughs> yes, I can see it. That's okay. So you've got some basic edit controls in here. And they are very, very basic. So changing light, color, and what they call pop. So, ew, yuck. <laughs> so these are quite basic tools in what you can do. And they're simple things. So if you're on the go, it's also got um, cropping. And I think rotation's done in some weird way by sliding. Yep, there we go. So you can do basic things like straighten things up and that sort of thing. I don't use this. So when I come out of here, I'm going to go back into photos. I'm actually going to share this to an editor called Snapseed, which I hopefully you'll see. Now, Snapseed's similar, and the editor that's in Google Photos, guess what? It came from Snapseed, but they dumbed it down so much, it's actually not that useful anymore. So I prefer to use Snapseed itself. When you come into this thing, you can see there's a, a, a whole lot more tools that you can use. One of the favorite ones is Curves. Um, this is very similar to the Lightroom tool or Photoshop or anywhere else that you see Curves. And you can set some points on your curve and you can start to adjust things. So you can do quite creative things. You can also get quite ugly. But you can also do quite subtle things, like I'll bring the mid-tones up just a tiny bit there. I'll drop my ducks a little bit more, a little bit more. So I've actually done something bad with the reds there. I have hurt that image. So let's just try and bring that back. So it's a different kind of editing tool. We've got someone joining in a little bit late. 
Uh, someone just said an editor called VSCO is the best. It is actually a good editor, but I happen to prefer SnapC, but that's just me. Whatever editor works for you, that's what you want to use. Um, there are so many of them out there, and lots of them are good. So if you're happy with one, please use it. Now, I'll just, actually I do want to continue editing. SnapC does have all these style things where you can make really quick changes if you want to. They actually do fairly well. Um, and to be honest, if you're doing stuff for maps, they are probably good enough. So, but you can do some really advanced stuff too. I and mean, you saw how many tools there are in there. I'm not going to go through them all, but um, Selective lets you change small areas of an image. So I won't go in there. If you go into Perspective, is a, a one that can be quite useful. This one's not a building, so perhaps I should show you with a building. But you can move it as though you were moving. So if you weren't 90 degrees to your subject, you can move around a little bit. And to some extent, you can actually help. It's not going to be perfect because you're dealing with an image. You're not dealing with capturing the original light. So that's the, the quick one in Snapseed. So I'll just come back to, I'll stop presenting this if I can. Maybe I can kill it myself from here. I'm just going to hide the position. And now I should be able to present. I better start Lightroom up while we're doing this. Has anybody got any questions while I start Lightroom up? Because anybody that uses it knows it takes forever. Just a tip, make sure not open the contacts, bro. <laughs> and Lightroom's still opening at the moment. I think I'm still presenting on the phone, so I just want to stop doing that. There we go. Oh, okay. I'm just going to leave that running because I might want to come back to it. So Are you using the download software version or the Creative Cloud one? Uh, I use Creative Cloud, and it's a... Creative Cloud is a paid version, if you like. Um, there is a freebie these days, which is the very old version of Lightroom. Now, I'll go with this one, and I'll go into Develop. Develop is the, the main editing module. In this image, I've actually missed the focus quite badly, because the focus should be on these flowers up here, and it's not. <laughs> It's pretty awful. Um, I shouldn't maybe have picked this one. Now, you'll notice that the tools are really similar. You've got that tone thing again. You've got some other tools that you generally don't see on phones, that, or sometimes they're there, but they tend not to work very well. Things like dehaze to remove mist and things like that. Uh, someone asked me last week about reflections. The dehaze tool can be relatively good about removing reflections. Where a big tool like this one really comes into its own is on noise control. So, oops, I just scrolled away. I just want to find a dark area of this image. There's one. So we're looking at this little panel over on the right at the moment. I hope you can actually see that because it's not very big. Uh, it's a little bit noisy. This one's not too bad, but you can do some work to remove some of the noise, but it does have an effect on the image. If you see an image on the main screen, I've cleaned up some noise that I could see in that little panel, but it's had a fairly profound effect on the image itself, and the image has lost some detail and gone a, a, even softer than it already was. So it's not always useful. Um, I'll just pop, I have to pop back to the meet for a moment because somebody wants to come in. And I can't. There we go. Let them in. Try and get back to Lightroom so you guys can see. You can see my t my folder sets in here. So there's the the 2020 set that you saw before, and you can see my working archive, which is all of the old ones. That they're sitting on another drive. So that's just a traditional spinny drive. There's, I'm not really going to show you through the rest of Lightroom because there is so much stuff that you can do with it that we would be here for months and months and months and months. So I'll just go back to the workshop slides. Has anybody got any particular questions about selecting a tool perhaps? is probably the best one to ask. Yash says the PC makes it look more cool. Yeah, it, it's... Um, 
probably very similar. So there are editing tools on phone and on various tablet devices that are easily as good as Lightroom. In fact, Lightroom actually is there. It's not quite as functional as the desktop version, but it is still very good. But there's a lot of other tools that are really good as well. Um, Shri has just asked how to reduce noise in images. It's actually hard. It's a difficult thing to do. Uh, you can get quite good at the noise reduction tools. Some of the other tools can help you by changing contrast and moving your shadows up and down. But if you're seeing noise, the real cause of that is lost information. So you didn't capture enough of the light. So if you're seeing a lot of noise in your dark areas, uh, someone asked if you can download Snapseed on your PC. You used to be able to, and if you've still got one, you can. <laughs> It's not available anymore, though. Actually, that might not be quite true because there is another to editor which I think is based on the Snapseed libraries. I'll look into that and I'll, I'll find out and see if I can find it for you. The When you want to reduce the noise, you're always going to have a trade-off because you're always going to introduce artifacts. Now, there's some new software around at the moment that uses machine learning or it's claimed artificial intelligence to remove the noise in images. And I have to say it does an amazing job. Um, I'm not going to plug it, but I'll tell you what it is. I even, even I haven't bought it yet. It's just too bloody expensive. Um, it's um, by Topaz Labs. And I think that that functionality will probably turn up in just about every editor in a year's time because everybody's looking at this software and going, that does some amazing stuff. I want to do that too. Right. And the reality is they're just using a, a TensorFlow engine, which is one of Google's products, to actually do it. So they're... IP, if you like, their knowledge is in the model that they've built. And other people are going to be able to do that. So it won't be long before it turns up in just about every software you can think of. But if you're desperate to remove noise, um, I've put a few demos from that tool on my Instagram, not because I support them or have anything to do with them in the slightest. I was just really impressed. Um, I'm contemplating buying it, but it is expensive. And the person behind me probably wouldn't want me to buy it. So. When we talk about resizing for Connect now, um, I'm going to use my PC for this demo because uh, even though this is really phone software, I'm going to use the PC because it's easier to present and it works on anything. So I'll just share a different tab with you guys. So who's had the problems of trying to get photos onto Connect and you've run into dramas? My Instagram ID is DropBearPaul. So I'll just in the background, open up a folder. Oops, do you know it really helps if you spell it right? So Squish.app is, um, it's actually a Google tool, but they don't present it that way. It's a demonstration of some of their libraries. Um, yes, I can type my handle into the chat, but I think someone's already done it. Thanks, Falguni. Um, there are, there's three Instagram accounts with Drop Bear Paul. One is my general stuff, which is where all my local guides things are. There's Drop Bear Paul Bricks, which is toy photography and Lego. And there's also my people photography. Um, my people photography one, Drop Bear Paul Photo, is not safe for work. So be careful where you look at it and only look if you like humans. Um, so we've all faced the problem of trying to get an image onto Connect. I need to get my folders back. And they're often just too big. So if I go, I know you won't be able to see what I'm doing at the moment, and I apologize for that, because I can't show you this particular part of what I'm doing. But let's say I want to get, uh, I am trying to find a file to use for you guys. And I'm not finding one that's big enough. All right, let's go with this one. Let's say I wanted to put this, which is a drawing by Ollie, onto Connect. The original file, this particular one's actually not too bad. So this is 1.29 meg. So you could actually use this one. But this tool, remember it runs on phone as well. It runs in your web browser likes Chrome, likes just about every other web browser around. 
you can really easily resize an image either physically like that but you can also change your quality level and you'll notice that the the file will be significantly smaller but you can also see the trade-off it gets a bit softer so you wouldn't see that nearly as much with a photo so let me try and load up another one just so we can see the example I unfortunately cleared out all my exported images so I'll just export a couple from Lightroom now yes I've just got a couple of files out that are going to be particularly big So we've got two little, there we are. There's the one I want. That's the one I was waiting for. So this image, 17 megabytes, you definitely wouldn't be able to put this one onto connect, but we can make some small changes in here. So Squish is still working on this one. Can you all see the screen okay? Hopefully you can. Um, this particular, so this image, Squish can drop it down to 2.23 and leave it at this full size. Now, Connect doesn't actually use images that big anyway. Um, Connect said it likes about 2,000 odd for the image width. So if I cut that down, in this case, by a third, and my quality settings are quite low, so let's bring those quality settings right up to about the high 80s, which is great for the web. 844K. Now you can do that on a phone. So all of those of you who are using Connect from your phone, and I know it's really, really popular to use it that way. Uh, the application is squish.app. I'll just type it into the thing. Um, and it's a demo of one of the Google libraries. So um, it'll last as long as Google does. So you can see that the image does lose some quality when you resize it. But when you look at that at the normal kind of level, it's kind of hard to tell that it did really. So when you add, add that image to connect, the original high quality one versus what you save, you really can't tell the difference at this size. And the connect images are probably a little bit smaller than this. So I thought I'd show you that one because it's a really handy tool. Now I'll just stop presenting that and I'll go back to the presentation. Has anybody got any questions about squish.app before I go out of there? Nobody? Let me check the chat and make sure. Oh, my chat's freezing again. No, we've just had someone join us now and it's almost time to finish. In fact, it's past time to finish, but that's okay. So we've talked about doing that. Now we're going to talk a little bit about composition and this is the last thing we're talking about today. You're probably glad, you're probably sick of hearing my voice at the moment, it's been an hour. I'm amazed I've still got some tea left. So there are some key things in composition. I'm going to give you these ones for today. Fill the frame with something that's of interest to you. Not anyone else, you. So if you're looking at something, let's take the little pink skull, for example. If the little pink skull's all the way out here, who'd know? But if the little pink skull is most of the image, yes, I know it goes out of focus on the webcam, then you can clearly see what the image is about. And that's the idea of filling the frame with the thing that's of interest to you. So when someone looks at it, they go, I know what that image is of, I know what it's about. If you think back to earlier in the, the workshop, I showed you the two images of that sculpture one of them had a whole lot of other things the traffic lights the fence and some cars and one of them was really clear of just the sculpture that's the kind of thing i mean so with fill the frame the left hand image there yeah it's a donut you can tell it's a donut it might have its place if i was sharing that on instagram yeah i'd probably use an image like that 
But if I wanted to show off the quality of donuts from a donut shop for maps, I probably wouldn't. I maybe have at times, but I would suggest not. Um, the right hand one showing that box of donuts is showing off the donuts really nicely. The light's night, nice, but most importantly, it's filled the frame with donuts. There's no extra things. They are yummy donuts, by the way. If you're ever in Victoria or in Melbourne, visit a place called Daniel's Donuts. Excellent. I do not work there or have anything to do with them. They're just awesome. People line up. Even at 2 o'clock in the morning, there'll be people lined up for these things. The next tip is to keep it simple and clean. Now, you can't always do this for images that are going onto maps because that left-hand image, for example, is a, an image of a store, and it really does represent what that store is like. It's a, it's a, a discount material and homeware store. It's chaotic in there. So any image you take in there is going to have an element of chaos. It's going to be fairly chaotic. But if you can try and reduce that, so in that particular image, it's kind of okay for maps because it shows they have lots of sails, it shows they have rugs, it shows they have cushions, but probably showing the individual products would be better. So in this, on the right-hand image where I'm saying simple and clean, that's from a fruit store and that's their tomatoes. And that one going in nice and close, filling the frame with the tomatoes, you can see the quality of the produce. You can see that it's fresh, you can see that it's probably gonna taste nice. So there's a, a bit of a difference between the two concepts. The next one is the rule of thirds. Now, this one often gets photographers going and there are some photographers that absolutely stick by it and there are others that don't care about it at all. But like I talked about earlier, when you're starting out, I would encourage you to use the rule of thirds. I find that I unconsciously use it now and I think most photographers, even those that claim not to use it, probably actually do because all it's really doing is you're using the sense of what's aesthetic in the image. And all it, <clears throat> all it really means to, to use it in its simplest sense, the things that are important should be on a place where the lines intersect. It doesn't really matter which of the four intersections you use but any of those intersections, the most important thing could be there. So if you're taking a picture of a person's face, um, the nearest eye should go onto one of those intersections. If you're trying to line up some mountains or something like that for a landscape shot, try and make the boundary between the land and the sky go across one of the horizontal lines or near to it. Similarly, if you're shooting the sea, have the sea against one of the bottom horizontal lines. So I'll show you some examples. So images are complex. So it's not always obvious where the rule of third stuff is at play. So this is an image I showed you guys last week when I was showing you the demo of what the, the touch feature does in the app. Um, and you might look at that and think it doesn't really obey the rule of thirds at all. But it actually does. So the boundary between the sea and the cliff is near to one of the horizontal lines. The main points of interest, which are in this case are the bushes and the rocks and the seaweed on the left-hand side of the image, run straight down one of the vertical lines. Things like that tend to draw your eye to the place that the photographer wanted you to see. You can go overboard with it, so don't get too hung up on the thirds. But just think about it when you're framing images. Most cameras, including phones, have a way to turn on a grid, which will help you. So look through your settings, find a way to turn on the grid. Now they'll have, some of them have thirds grids, some of them have fifth grids. I'd, I'd suggest sticking with the thirds because to me the fifth one doesn't really make that much sense. So on this one, a picture of one of our cats. Her face is the most important thing there and the action that she's doing with her tongue. She's actually asleep in this photo. Bizarre, she sleeps with one eye open. But um, I put her nose on the, the corner because it just sort of makes you look in towards her face. And it's a cat. Who could not like a cat? <laughs> Again, with this shot in, out in the wet garden, the flower is mostly in the uh, top left of the image so it's not quite on the lines 
but that's okay because it's using that quadrant of the image, that area. I shouldn't say quadrant because it's not a division by four, but anyway, you get what I mean. So the task this week, just like we had one last week, there's a Google album. So let me just, whoops, I'm gonna pop back one. I'll just copy this album and paste it into the chat. That album's there now and ready to go for your contributions. Um, that, what I'd like you to do is use those three simple concepts, filling the frame, using the rule of thirds, and keep it simple and clean. And you could submit one or two or three or whatever images you want to put in there. Please don't put in hundreds because I do like to comment on them all. Um, if you put those up in the next 24 hours or so, I'll be making, it's Sunday night for me now, I'll be making this image, this video on Tuesday night. So as long as you get them in before my Tuesday night, which is actually about 48 hours from now, but try and get them in in the next day or so for you. Um, I'll give you some feedback on each image. I'll be, I'll keep it just to the image content. Um, what I'd like to do is see those, and like last time, they'll go on to the end of the video. Has anybody got any questions about those things? Uh, Tejal says, hello, Paul, your toys are amazing behind you. And he said that he visited a doll museum. Yeah, I remember that post, actually. Um, there's a question from Sonia. Does it have to be a real camera photo or a mobile phone photo? Do you know a mobile phone camera is just as real as any other camera? So the answer to your question is use your phone if you want. That's fine. No problem at all. So the definition of a camera, which we talked about in the first session, there's a lens of some kind. There's an imaging device of some kind, which could be chemical or it could be computerized. And there's a way of looking at them. A phone kind of makes all of those criteria, so it is a camera. And Neil's asking me, how is the Lego? Maybe Baby Yoda should tell you how the Lego is. <laughs> I made that for Tracy because she's obsessed with Baby Yoda. <laughs> yep, and as Falguni says, phone camera is very handy. Indeed it is. Uh, are there any other questions on the task? Hi, so earlier you told that landscape images do better than uh, portraits. So why it was something about that? Okay, sure. Um, now, in general, there's nothing, and I'm just looking up one of the Instagram handles that someone put in the chat there. Um, in general, there's nothing wrong with portrait or landscape. It suits the image that you're making. So landscape is called what it's called because it's really good for images of the countryside or mountains, features that are long and horizontal. So buildings tend to fit that and which right. is why maps prefers you to use landscape images weirdly when they do video they want you to do portrait maybe that's because okay. videos are mostly about people and portrait is mostly images of people although it can really can work for other things as well so ananda showed us before that image of the structure on the ground where portrait suits that image well and suits the composition yeah. so there's no wrong answer okay um, yeah. It's a bit like it, it's a bit like producing a document. You can choose between landscape and portrait. They're both right for yeah, different exactly. reasons. Yeah. So okay. Maps Thank just you. prefers landscape images because they display better. Is the yeah. only reason they like them. Oh, okay. Cool. And goodbye to the people that have to go. Um, are there any other questions around the task? Hi, Paul. Hi, Felicia. Hi, can I ask, ask a question out of from today's topic? Actually, sure. it's still about camera. Yeah, I would like to know, in your opinion, how we, how could we do to, to maximize the using of entry-level camera? For example, I'm the user of entry-level DSLR. When I want to take a picture in a dark place, in a dark, and I want to focus on the, on the picture with the blur image, how we could do to maximize the use thing of the camera. Sure. Um, so let's take a step back. 
the first thing I'd suggest yes. is what we talked about last week is learn how to take some manual control of your camera. So don't let it make all the decisions. You should be making either a decision about the size of the aperture, which is the amount of light coming in to the camera, which is setting your depth and we'll cover depth properly in a future session, or you want to set the shutter speed. And the reason that you want to set the shutter speed in your example is you need that shutter speed to be fairly quick because you're taking a photo in a dark place and if you're not quick enough, then your image will be blurred. Now, there's some things yeah. you can do about that. So let's say your lens is 50 millimetres long. Yeah. Um, for handheld photography, as a simple rule, um, multiply that length by two and that should be the slowest you go as a shutter speed. Now, it doesn't work for everything and it doesn't work for everyone because some people's hands move more than others. But if you've got mm. a 50 millimetre lens, then try not to go below uh, a hundredth of a second for your photo time. Um, I try and actually get better than that. I, I, I would try for 200th because if, you, if you're on the borderline of what's going to work, you will get that blur. Now, with most cameras, don't be afraid of high ISO. So the ISO is the setting of the sensitivity of the sensor. You can use high ISO in dark situations to get a quicker shutter speed. You need to practice with your camera and you need to learn when it starts putting in an unacceptable amount of noise for you. So particularly cheaper cameras tend to have problems with noise when the ISOs go up. The more expensive cameras, not so much. They do still have it, but not as badly because there has to be a difference between the two. Uh, now, one thing that you can use to really help you is something to steady the camera. So, do you own a tripod? Sorry, pardon me? Do, do you own a tripod? I don't have it. <laughs> okay. Um, a tripod is just a stand with three legs. That's why it's called a tripod. And the camera sits on top of it, and it screws mm. into that little hole in the bottom of the camera. Sadly, I don't actually have a camera with me this evening. Um, but there's, a, there's a little hole in the bottom, and they're all the same little hole, at least our grade of cameras are. And the tripod screws into that and holds it. When you're using a tripod, you can expose for a really long time. There's, there's some other tricks that can help you with that, but we'll cover that in another session because it's probably getting a bit complex for most people. Okay. But Thank that, you. That reduces the blur because it reduces the camera movement. Okay. Any other questions? Hello, this is Zeva. Firstly, I would like to thank you heartily to arrange such like meetup. Question is how to add photos, such place which does it allow to photo like the So, how can you add photos? You're, you're, breaking up. you're breaking up a lot. So, if you could type your question into the chat and I'll come back to it after you've typed it, would that be okay? Thank you. Cool. Yeah, because I couldn't quite understand what you were asking. So while JPAL's typing into the chat, has anybody got another question? You're a quiet bunch tonight. <laughs> I'll have to pick on Jesse again. Have you got any questions? Looks like Stuart might have one. He's turned his microphone on. Yeah, quick question about editing tools. If you could recommend something as an alternative to Lightroom for desktop. I, I don't want to invest in the Creative Cloud. I've got some old, I've got the old software downloaded version, but I think it's yep. outdated now. I was wondering if you could recommend something, because I'm going to lose the software when I update the operating system on my Mac. The, the old version that I have is not com will not be compatible with the new operating system. Yeah, that's always problematic. It's the way they get you eventually. Um, I'll actually hand over to Ananda because he is the king of finding free software that's really cool. And I know which one he usually recommends. <laughs> Bring him on. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was looking for my list um, of software. I've been playing around with a few, uh, as Paul knows. Uh, I play with um, some paid ones. I play with some free ones. Um, um, I'll drop a link when I can find my spreadsheet there. I can put a spreadsheet out for you. Um, if you want free, there's a uh, raw therapy, uh, which uh, do you want to, to edit raw or do you want uh, just to edit JPEGs? Raw, raw. 
Uh, raw therapy will be available on multiple platforms. T H E R A P E E therapy. Um, yeah, we'll that therapy on again. Say again. That's uh, okay. Then, I'm checking the name. Uh, uh, therapy, and then uh, there is a DAP table uh, that's free as well. Um, Sorry, could you repeat that, please? That name? Uh, the raw therapy or the DAP table? DAP table. DAP table. Dark as in uh, uh, black. Okay. Yeah, got you. That's like Lightroom, but backwards. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'll I'll find the link if I can find. Paul, keep them, keep them entertained. I'll find my spreadsheet. Yep, sure. So I was just looking to see if that question got typed into the chat or not, and I don't see it. No, oh, well, if you want to um, send me the question later, I will answer it via PM, JPAL, if you haven't, can't type it into the chat. Um, just send it to me as a private message on Connect and I'll, I'll answer it there. How to click raw photos on a mobile? Anshuks asked this. Some phones support it, not all of them. And in the phones that do support it, some of the camera apps support it, but again, not all of them. Google camera does and it does on all of their recent phones. I know the LG phones support it. Um, the newer Samsungs support it. The newer Huawei phones do. So it comes down to what your phone can actually do, whether the ca inbuilt camera drivers will let the camera software save raw. But load Google camera app onto the phone and find it in the settings and see if you can turn it on. Just remember when you start shooting RAW on your phone, actually the iPhone does too, I should point that out, even though I don't use one, it, it does work fine. Um, I should point out if you start shooting RAW on your phone, unless you manage your space carefully, you're going to run out really fast because RAW files are a lot bigger than the JPEG files or the HEIFs on an iPhone. Uh, Could I ask a question about the, the, the link uh, to the raw processing software that I that I started some time ago? Yep. Um, may not be the fullest up to date. It's in the chat. Cool. Yep. So Ananda's put in his spreadsheet of software there, so you'll be able to get to that. He's very handy because he loves playing things. <coughs> um, we've got a question from Yash about anti-banding and banding. I've never actually heard of that, to be honest. Uh, it could be um, it could be the uh, synchronization uh, of the AC current, uh, Paul, 50 hertz, 60 hertz. Yeah, I guess the only other thing I can think of that would fall into that name might no, be. No, I, I checked the shutter. camera settings and they to display the option of anti-bending. That's why I asked. Okay, I've never actually heard of it. I will um, look into that and I will have an answer for you for the next one. I hope. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thus proving I don't know everything, despite what people say. Uh, Isha has asked if we can use the rule of thirds on only objects, or can we use it on scenery as well? It's good for everything. So th there's not really any kind of image that it doesn't work for, except for deliberately completely chaotic images. So if you're making an, um, an exposure of light trails or something like that, it's not quite as applicable to that kind of thing. OK, thanks, Paul. No worries. You could certainly use it for that bridge behind you. So has anybody else got any other questions or will we wrap up for the evening? Well, I have evening a question about the DNG format which you mentioned, Paul. Uh, DNG is a Adobe version of RAW. They have released it publicly. They say it's um, open source and free, but we'll rain to see how well that lasts. <laughs> but yeah, I've converted all my RAW into DNG as I import into the light, into Lightroom. So if I exported to use another program, would that DNG format be compatible? Depends on the program. A lot of them, yes. So the 
Topaz software I was talking about before, they will work with DNG and they will save back into DNG. Um, that's the, the cool thing about DNG is you actually can save your changes into it because it keeps the original raw file and within the file, it keeps the edit steps. Now you do need the original software to keep reproducing those. We've just had someone join us an hour and a half after we're due to start. That's impressive. That's a new record. Oh. I'll just see what I'm presenting, okay, for a minute. Hey, Paul. Hello there. Uh, how to upload photo to Instagram without changing the size? So you want to share a photo without changing its size? Yeah. Uh... So is this for putting them on to connect or sharing them to somewhere else? She said about posting on Instagram, I suppose. Oh, on Instagram. Okay. Um, Instagram likes to make things square, but it doesn't have to. There's two little things that look like that in the left-hand corner when you're posting. So you can make it go to the size that you want. Now, Instagram, like most of the social networks, always resize your image. They always save them as a lower quality version. It's just what social networks do because you can imagine billions and billions and billions of people sharing their lives constantly. That takes an enormous amount of storage. So they try and minimize that. Um, there are a couple of social networks, or well, they're not quite social networks, they're more photo sites like um, things like SmugMug, where you can put your images. Um, trying to think what the other one is. It'll come to me. I'll come back to that. Um, but there, there are some image sharing sites where you can share and they won't change your size at all. But they do have size limits on those sites. And if you want to use more space, then you have to pay. Yep. So we talked about squish before as well for changing the size of images or changing the quality of images. So you don't have to change the size. You can just change the quality. It's always the trade-off. Are there any other questions? Yeah, Paul, I just dropped a link and then see that once. Yep, okay, I see that. I think just I was open that in a new tab. Ah, yeah, okay. So I've just looked at the image. I'll present it to everybody and just switch to that one. So that is what Ananda was talking about. Why can't yep. I see that tab? I can't actually present that tab. How about that? Oh, well, that's life. Oh, maybe I can. Maybe it's... No, it's not that one. There we go. Found it. I can present it. So this is the camera settings that um, Yash was asking about. And it is what Ananda was saying. So that Andy banding, I don't know what you guys know about electricity, but electricity generally around the world comes in two frequencies, 50 hertz or 60 hertz. Most places in the world, I think, are 50. The US is 60. Yep, I know about it, but what's the use in camera settings? I just want to know that. Um, when you're trying to take pictures from things like fluorescent lights, which flicker at that frequency, it can help with that so that you don't end up with um, seeing black bars in your image because you had a period of darkness while the light was flickering. Um, it can also help with taking pictures from a video screen. Okay, thank you. I was actually surprised to see it in there. I've not seen any apps with that before. That's okay. <laughs> you got something new. I did. Well, I, I do tell people that every one of these workshops I learn something too. So there you go. I just did. It's cool. You got a subject to research on. Um, that app I showed, the waiting, I'll just put a, another link into it. Squish.app. I'm just getting a link for you now. And I'll put that into the chat. So that works on your phone just as well as it works on computer. It's actually designed for phones, so it's a little bit better. It's got a very good responsive interface. 
Thank you, Paul. Anil here. Yeah, you're welcome, Anil. And you can, of course, use Snapseed. Snapseed runs on just about everything. So that's sure, a sure, very, sure. very good editor. Um, so I'll give you an official tip. Cool. Um, has anybody else got any questions? Or we'll... No? Looks like that's it. So we'll probably close this down for the evening. So do you remember your task or do you want to see that again? We do remember. I'll just show that again while we all say our goodbyes to each other. So I took a screenshot you... of it. Can you see Paul? Take the screenshot. Oh, you want me to? You want me to do a shot with everybody? <laughs> All right. I should should do these more, really. Cool. <laughs> well done. So, I'll post a recap to this just before I put the video up on YouTube, and you will be able to. Oops, this phone is now talking again. Let me kill it. Oh. Paul, I had a question for fill the fill the frame. Yep. Uh, uh, do we have to take the food, or we can take nature or something else? Anything. Anything. Anything that makes you happy. Okay. Thank you. And but, Adrian, but please don't go out. Well, that depends where you live. So where I live, I'm allowed out, which is kind of a handy thing. And yes, I'll reshare the album link, Adrian. I was looking for it in the chat, but it's, it's easier to do it this way. So that's the task album link. Who is allowed out, just as a general thing? We're, we're allowed out, Czech Republic. So Czech Republic's out. Australia is kind of out. We have limitations. Um, we can go as far from home as as we want, as long as we can return to home in that day. So we're allowed to do day trips again. We're allowed into our parks and national parks again, which is great. My wife and I went and walked on the beach this evening. What about public transports? Yeah, public transport's all running. I've taken more photographs in the last six weeks than I have probably in the last year. <laughs> Just because you can take long walks and you're often alone. And what else yep. are you going to do? Take a camera, have a look around and take pictures of everything. And That's the streets great. are empty as well. So you've got a lot more photographic opportunities. It's great. Yeah. I loved it. In, we were officially allowed out this week. But um, if you could go shopping for, for stuff, quote, essential, unquote, things right since the start and i have to say last week i think people got sick of being locked up because last week everybody was out before we were allowed to <laughs> you could always say that photography is essential well i i take not a cost of life, no. yeah i take a camera with me when i go out in the bike ride um yes that's true but this if you're taking the right precautions and you're avoiding other people you're not likely to have an issue. I know where you live, it's very hard to avoid other people because there's just so many people. So it's a challenge. And it is, yeah, it is a very is. serious thing, yes, but and just take whatever your local government advice is. So it depends where you are. I don't think Jess is allowed out yet. I can tell because I haven't seen any outside photos on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> no, All right then. Yeah, you all have to stay in. Soon. But everyone is surely posting their throwback photos. <laughs> yes, everybody's posting their old photos, that's for sure. Um, people are sharing their connect IDs in the chat, which is fine. It's a good thing to do. Mm. Um, what is there in your hand, Paul, today? And someone else has asked from my Instagram, what is in my hand? It's a clothes peg. <laughs> this thing. The latest one. Which one was it? I'm wondering how I was able to see your hand. 
They're here. <laughs> I'm just fiddling with a clothes peg. Cool. All right, then. So we might as well wrap that up there, I think. And I will stop the recording shortly. But we have to do that thing we did last week because it was funny. So everybody unmute yourselves. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Paul. You're very welcome. Thank you, Paul. 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 We all on mute. Thank you. We're gonna, we're gonna say local guides again. Bye, Bye guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm gonna ask you free, and then we'll all say local guides. Okay. So one, two, three. Thank you, Paul. So, local guides. Local guides. Local guide. Yeah. Well done, Adrian. Local guide. <laughs> Local guide. Oh, you're last, you're not yeah. there, you've just been beaten. <laughs> we are local guys. All right. We are local guys. guys. Hi, I shared a Hi, feedback link. I shared a Good feedback night. link in the chat. So if you leave me feedback, I particularly like to know what you want to hear about. Um, I did change this session based on last week's feedback. So, thank you, you know, Paul. and that's what we'll chat about. Say a big thank you, everyone in our group. Okay, bye, Paul. Thank you very much, Paul. Yeah. See you later. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Paul. And we'll see you next week, I hope.